Hello, everybody. My name is Jessica Green, and I'm the Artistic Director of the Houston Cinema Arts Festival. Welcome to the Houston Cinema Arts Festival 2020 and the post uh, screening discussion of the absolutely genius Smooth Talk. We are so lucky and honored to have the director with us, uh, Joyce Chopra, who is uh, really quite legendary. And I am not going to actually read a bio of um, Joyce and we're just gonna sprinkle the conversation uh, with some, you know, throughout with some questions that'll get to this incredible history of this incredible legendary woman that we are in the pres presence of and lucky to be in the presence of. So first we're gonna talk about Smooth Talk though because that's what you guys just watched and I hope you love it, loved it as much as I do. Um, so Joyce, hello, how are you? <laughs> it's it's oh, wonderful to have you. Words. My God, legendary, an honor, all that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's true, it's That's true. I mean, okay. they're, yeah, the real legends are just legendary and they just are and no, you know, they, it's just, it just is. So yeah, I can say that. Um, so yeah, so um, smooth talk, you know, first I just want to get some background um, around, you know, I guess first and foremost, how you came to adapt, you know, the um, Joyce Carol Oates story. Um, mm -hmm. Where are you going? Where have you been? Um, how your, you know, husband, Tom Colt, you know, came to write the screenplay. Um, Laura, how Laura Dern was cast in the film. How you came to okay, direct I'll it. Try to, yeah. I'll try to do it all in one. Yeah, just a little background on the, on the film. I, my husband, Tom, is a short, he's no longer alive, but he was a, a short story writer as well as a screenwriter and a playwright. And he had a, one of his first short stories was called, it's a collection called the O'Henry Awards. And every year, I don't know if it still exists, but top short stories were, anyway, he was in a short story collection with Joyce Carol Oates, Where mm -hmm. Are You Going? Where Have You Been? The short story. And I read that, I think that was in the seventies. I really, mm -hmm. it was well before I made the movie. And it just- It came out in 66. Me. The story came out in 66. But was it? It was published in 66 for the first time. So that's when I 1966, read? yeah. I read it in 66. And I think yeah. those awards are still around. I believe the O'Henry Awards still do exist, but I'm not 100% sure, but please continue. Well, anyway, I read it and it just stayed with me and it scared me. Oh, it haunted me, scared me. I just couldn't, you know, anyway, when the time came, I had produced a play of Tom's for a program on PBS that no longer exists called American Playhouse mm -hmm. that ran all through the 80s and 90s. And Little on a rag about a black Vietnam war. Oh, I won't go into that. I keep in danger of going off into side stories. Anyway, the producers of that program said we're, we're encouraging first time, you know, documentary filmmakers, direct actors to direct their first features, bring us a script. So, oh, I'm sorry, preceding that, I had optioned, I'm sorry, I had optioned the Joyce Carol Oates. Right, story. right, yeah. yeah. For five thousand dollars. What foresight? Hmm. That was a lot. But Joyce Carol yeah. just knew Tom, so that made it kind of easy. Right, right. And so I told them about this. I gave them the short story, and they welcomed it. And so they paid for the Directors Guild minimum, so fifteen thousand dollars. And Tom happily wrote the screenplay, hmm. and they liked it very much and agreed to produce it. But the problem is. It was such little money. All they could put up was six hundred thousand dollars, right. and we needed, to, even with every actor working for minimums and me working for basically nothing, we still needed well over a million. Mm. So uh, a producer friend of ours actually came up with the rest of the money. Mm. Okay, how did we catch Laura? Is the question? Yeah, Laura Dern. Yes. Okay, I cast Treat Williams first. I, I couldn't imagine anybody else in that part, but Treat was incredible. Husband in various movies and I just yeah. he combines all these things he was incredible a friend introduced me to him so that was locked down and he was very busy he was he had only one week in a late September 85 mm. and we could not find anybody to play Connie we had I had read with dozens of young actresses east coast west coast in the middle of the country nobody could play this part they, she came across a little bitch mm. Really, it was just mm -hmm. somebody always fighting with her mother. And, you know, she, anyway, two weeks before filming, I had in mind one young actress who was very good, but not great, 
I wasn't excited about it. And our producer was on the phone with uh, a still photographer, Nancy Ellison, who lived in Malibu on the beach, Malibu Colony, <clears throat> where a lot of the movie people lived. Mm -hmm. And Martin was talking to her, my producer. We were in San Francisco, <clears throat> excuse me, north of San Francisco. And I'm saying, this is our situation. She said, I see her, not I see an actress. I see her. She's walking on the beach right by. My, she's my neighbor's daughter, Bruce Dern. Mm. So I got on the phone and she again described Laura, but in terms of her, mm. she was so confused. <laughs> it was very strange. Anyway, I flew mm. down to LA the next day. Mm. And, I know I called Laura. And as you know, if you've seen the film, Handyman, the James Taylor song is very much part of the script. Mm -hmm. And Laura was playing Handyman on her answer. Oh, show. whoa. I didn't even have to read her. I knew she. Yeah, I mean, there's so much verisimilitude, and I want to get into the layer. There's so many layers of verisimilitude here that are part anyway, of what makes it so rich. Yeah. It's, anyway, oh. I flew there. Laura was her reading was wonderful. Um, something I thought about last night. I haven't talked about. Laura has stood with she's off balance. I said, Yeah. Why do you stand like that? Do you have scoliosis? She said, no, I'm very worried that I'm taller than Treat and you won't cast me. <laughs> I completely forgot about that until last night. Oh. I was standing in a funny way. Anyway, and that was Laura. That's how we found Laura. Wow. Last minute. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And the rest is history. And it won the Grand Jury Prize at the 1985 Sundance uh, yeah, um, Film Festival. And yeah, and I would also say that um, you know, Mary Kay Place's performance as Catherine also could have been just a big bitch, but she also, you know, the two of them, it's like, oh, from the big, yeah, <laughs> you know. She wants her daughter back. She yeah, I mean, the life that they breathe into these characters and like from the beginning, how honest it is, how much it sees mother daughter mm -hmm. dynamics, especially at that, you know, adolescent stage is just incredible, you know? Um, and yeah, it's so rooted in your direction, in the script, in their performances. It's but we also so... had a teenage daughter at the time. So. Yeah, well, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to mention that. I mean, I have thought about that too, as I watched the film again, um, you know, and I'd emailed you what this film means to me. I mean, and I just want to thank you again. You know, I, I see this film as part of, you know, it's singular and then also as part of um, you know, some other films that were happening in that period that were made by women about, you know, adolescent women that I think really saw us in ways that were really honest and fearless that we hadn't been seen before. I was an adolescent woman at that time. I think your film was really instructive and really important for me. I think the fact that you had a daughter around the same age and Laura Dern was around the same age, you know, it just all came together um, in, yeah, huh? Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in, in New York City, in Manhattan. Huh. Yeah, yeah, and I saw it in a movie theater, you know, and I'm around the same age as your daughter, I believe, and I'm around the same age as Laura Dern. And it just, yeah, and it's just like, you know, between, you know, Smooth Talk and between, um, you know, Fast Times and Martha Coolridge doing Valley Girl. I think, you know, there's something to be said for the fact that women were at the helm of these, you know, these movies about young women um, and incredibly gifted, brilliant directors like yourself were at the helm. And I just want to thank you. I think, you know, for my generation, these films were really important. And right now in this moment, like I've been talking to so many filmmakers, everybody's talking about, you know, seeing what's not seen, right? And, in, and especially in 2020, we're really thinking about and focusing on, right? And seeing things we haven't seen. And these films, your film Smooth Talk was to me, an earlier example of that, of really seeing what wasn't being seen and showing what wasn't being shown. And yeah. I just want you to know what it meant to, for <laughs> women like me that were that same age at that time, it was, it was powerful, you know? It was, it was really powerful. And um, I just wanna make sure you know that and I wanna thank you for that. And I'm sure there are other women feel the same way, you know? Yeah, I have to say that the film came out the same week as Pretty in Pink. The John mm. movie. Mm -hmm. That film made a fortune. Yeah. We barely made our money back. And teenagers did not flock to our movie. They flocked to Pretty in Pink. 
you're you're the exception. well i i i flock to smooth talk and they're yeah. they're yeah there you are yeah I mean, there were others but it, mostly it was adults who went to it very few kids went to it yeah but maybe growing up in new york city there was a realness to it yeah. that spoke to me in a way frankly you where you grew up. yeah yeah maybe some of these suburban movies didn't speak to me in the same way and and my mother is from rural michigan so like the country Thing was also familiar i spent you know summers yeah. in the country in rural michigan so that yeah. was also that kind of listlessness i know that feeling of being a teenager in the country and being like ah i gotta get out i gotta where are the people where are the kids where you know she's literally hitting the walls she, yeah she's no i mean the oh. way she walks around that house is just so freaking real it's like i love it it's incredible um i just wanted to also add because it's interesting for folks on this um that aren't familiar. So, you know, we talked about you had optioned the Joyce Carol, the incredible story, where are you going, where have you been, which I really recommend to anybody, um, you know, on this that hasn't read it. It's absolutely incredible. I also will say that, as I also emailed you, I think this is one of the greatest film adaptations of literature ever made. To me, yeah. it's like top 10. Yeah, I think it's incredible. I think you, you just did an incredible adaptation. And just want to add that, um, yeah, it's a really, you know, it has a really interesting backstory. It's in part, in part, in part inspired, the Joyce Carol Oates story, by um, uh, three murders that happened in Tucson, Arizona, that were committed by Charles Schmidt. And this was covered in Life. Um, and the, and the uh, title of that article in Life, which was quite famous and scandalous at the time, was The Pied Piper of Tucson. So, it, you know, this has really interesting lineage there's a really interesting cultural you know social construct to it i would say there are even kind of hints of in the original story maybe manson and kind of even gets into this sort of you know idea within feminism of sort of like you know how that um how those situations happen how you have you know manson or how you have the arizona situation and sort of like teenage girls falling around creepy old guys why does that happen so anyway so i think that was a lot of what was kind of in the air at the time and there was a lot of exploration of that did you see the talk I did with Joyce Carolers and uh, Laura? For I did not, no, well, she, but please share. Well, it's on the website for the Lincoln Film Festival. It's also on YouTube. Okay. And I highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in adaptation because Joyce Carol Oates talks about the origins of the story, what her first drafts were like. Mm. For us, it was hor like Hawthorne, they were allegorical. Mm -hmm. And mm. yes. the main character was the guy yeah arnold friend yeah, yeah. funny later on in yeah so yeah very interested in no i i i i know yeah i mean i did i did some research i didn't want to be frankly too you know informed by another talk but <laughs> i did look into the um the background yeah and yeah i mean that's actually a question and maybe you don't have to answer it you may not want to but right yeah there's this idea that arnold friend is a kind of almost like a demon spirit and i was wondering is that something that you we had a treatment as real. No, we, we, he was real. He was real. Okay. Same. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. Right. But it is, but it, he does occupy an interesting space symbolically as a kind of bridge, right? Around burgeoning she, sexuality and identity. And I mean, there is symbolism there. Well, she oh. called the story originally Death and the Maiden. Yes. There you go. And Death came. Billy Dickinson wrote about it. You know, I couldn't. Have stop it to see, but anyway, I wouldn't quote that. But uh, you know, Treat played it, it was his interpretation of how he would impress a young girl and get her to come out of the house. And it was very fluid and he made the car very much part of his story. He made love to the car, he lay on the car. He, yes. you know, he that was his choice of how to do this part. Yeah. And I just gave him free reign. He was just, you know, Treese also uh, started out as a Broadway song and dance person. Did you ever see Hair? He was in Hair. Yeah, right, right, right. He He's danced right, down right, the yes. table in Hair. He yeah, was that's right. He yeah, was, he was in the film, uh, yeah. I saw him in Broadway on uh, Pirates of Penzance. He's, he's going yes. to be Dolly Parton special singing uh, starting on Netflix this Sunday. Right, right. That's yeah, no, it. Yeah. So he's, his body is a dancer. Yeah. Style. No, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, it, there is a lot of, yeah. I mean, him and the car in the last 30 minutes and the choreography, it's just, I mean, he's. He's pretty, he's a genius. Then, I can't. Yeah, take yeah. Yeah, every, I mean, 
Yeah, everybody's, I feel like everybody's performance in some talk. Everything about it is just, is just genius. So um, speaking of further genius, uh, James Taylor is the music director of Smooth in the film as well um, in Smooth Talk. James Taylor. Yeah, he's the music director, right, of Smooth Talk. He, he was the musical director. He was a neighbor. <laughs> He was a neighbor. Of, well, I was wondering, because yeah, that's an interesting, um, it's an opportunity to segue back to, did, so that didn't go back to the Club 47 Days okay. at all, the, J the James Who Taylor connection, like or did it? You want to talk about James Taylor first or the Club 47? I want to talk about both. Let's start okay. with James oh. Taylor, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about James Taylor first. Well, yeah. Tom, well, he was writing that scene uh, when Connie's friend has come to give her news that somebody is asking about her. But Connie doesn't want to listen, really. She's all, and she starts dancing to him. Well, Tom was writing that scene. And he wasn't quite sure how to center it. He was, he was looking for something extra. And he happened to be listening to James Taylor's Handyman. And he got the idea that they would dance, and that the mother would dance, unbeknownst to the daughter, in the next room. And anyway, so that became part of the script, specifically. And the lyrics work very well. And at the last scene, they were dancing to Handyman with a sister. And it so happened that James was a neighbor. It, it didn't start with James. It started with listening to his music. And he came by and we must have just finished writing something we were very happy about because we were in a cheerful mood. And he said, what are you both so happy about? And we said, oh, we've just been writing this script. He said, oh, I'd love to read it. Oh, OK. And he came back the next night and he said, can I be your music director? We said, no, James, we don't want to have anything to do with you. No, of course we said we'd love it. Yeah, that's how it happened. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, um, I mean, you started a folk club, Club 47. I, I, that was, that grew out of, I was 20. You were 21, weren't you? I wasn't quite 21. You I weren't even 21. <laughs> wow. I had graduated from college. I had from Brandeis, right? Brandeis. I had wanted yeah. to be an actress. I had okay. spent a lot of acting in college. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York, which is a terrific acting school. Mm -hmm. I only, I didn't last quite the year. I was, I couldn't afford to rent an apartment in Manhattan. And I was living with my parents way out at the end of Coney Island. And it was a very long trip. Plus, I couldn't take living at home with my parents anymore. They're wonderful. But whatever it was, I began to have anxiety attacks. I didn't even know what they were at the time. And I just had to get out. So I went back up to Cambridge uh, where I had lived while I was at Brandeis my senior year. Anyway, I ran into a friend. I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life. You know, I have a degree in comparative literature, which is useless. I don't wanna to go to graduate school. And we started talking and we said, let's start our own business. <laughs> let's, and I'd been- At in 20. Paris. At 20 years of age, yeah. No, let's try. I don't, I don't want. I don't want to learn typing. I was told to learn typing, become a secretary. That was the opportunities for. Women. This was 1957, correct? 57. About. Either yeah, that was that was the idea at the time. Go teach your art, learn to type. And yep, a that was the idea. Yep. So. Um, what did we do next? So you guys, yeah. I've been did. in Paris in my junior year, and. I'd been to many cafes. I said, let's start a cafe. I had a very pretentious French at this moment. <laughs> and I said, and we'll have racks of newspapers from all over the world. You know, we'll be an international cafe. So we rented a store near Harvard Square, practically in Harvard Square. And my parents very kindly lent me $1,000. And Paula had been working. She had 1000 Paula Kelly. And we opened up our, ready to open up our club, which we named Club 47 because we couldn't think of a name. It was, the address was 47 Mount Olive Street. And then a week or so before we were open, a friend of ours who was a senior at Harvard uh, was a very talented jazz band. And he said, you want music opening night? Oh, that would be wonderful. So we had music opening night and it was crowded because there was nothing like it. And this guy kept playing there. And so we became, to start with, a jazz club. Mm. We had great musicians from the Berklee School of Music in Boston. Mm. Of course, yeah. For almost, oh, the better part of a year, we were a very good jazz club. Uh -huh. And one night, a man named Peter Robinson, that was his name, came in and he said, um, 
friend of mine, a colleague at MIT has a daughter who's a talented folk singer. Would you um, audition her? We said, we're not a folk club, we're a jazz club. He said, well, well, just listen to her, please. On a Monday night when you're closed, okay, we'll do that. So then walks this skinny girl with long black hair and she, there was nobody there but myself and Paula and Joan, maybe she brought her family, I don't remember. Anyway, she gets up on the stage and she starts singing and we go, oh God. To hear Joan in a room yeah. is quite wonderful. Joan Baez. Talking Joan about Baez. Her. I'm yeah. sorry. Joan Baez. So Joan was hired for $10 a night to sing on Wednesday and Thursday nights, oh. I think. She was yeah. a student at BU. Wow. So the place was packed almost right away. They couldn't, they, literally, they were standing on top of things. And after a while, we switched her to the weekends. So she sang there. Over the Smart weekend. move. <laughs> we bumped her up to $25 and I yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, at some point, oh God, they, she's probably sang there for almost a couple of years. Wow. I continue to go to a jazz club in Boston. When, the, when our place closed, I love jazz. And while I was there, a guy was pointed out to me, Grossman, what was his first name, Grossman? I can't remember. Anyway, he was Odetta's manager. Odetta was a very popular folk singer at the mm -hmm. time. Yes. And I went up to him and I said, oh, Albert, I said, sir, we have a very talented kid playing at our place. He hardly responded and we left. And the next night, Albert is sitting there in a chair. He never said hello to me. He never, he's just sitting there and he listens. He's like a stone. And after that, Joan disappeared. <laughs> he, he hired her immediately, he took her to Chicago to the Golden Gate. And then before we knew it, she was at Newport. So wow. I went to that. Yeah, that's how I met Joan. Oh, and the rest and of the And the club party went on to become a really uh, the home of a lot of great folk music for quite yes. a while. Yeah, it's still so it's still around, but it has a different name. Yes, there was a 2012 documentary made about this club that you started <laughs> when you were 20. Yeah. <laughs> and Bonnie Raitt went to Radcliffe just so she could be close to Club 47. But apparently it was uh -huh. shut. Yeah, it was shut down the year she entered in to Radcliffe. <laughs> so she didn't get her Club 47. It was shut down for a year. <laughs> what happened? Well, yeah, like, so, separate story about the but I mean, so yeah, it's, oh my God, so incredible. So, I mean, that leads into my next question, like, especially in this time when people are going through what they're going through, they're reevaluating re a lot of things. Opportunities are shifting, are diminishing, or maybe are emerging. Yeah. Things are, are yeah. really shifting. Can you just share a little bit about how you get from that to then working with Ricky Leacock? And by the way, I worked with Albert Maisels for seven years. I was the director of the Maisel Cinema in Harlem. So I worked closely with Albert. I never met Ricky Leacock, but I worked close with Albert and I met D.A. Pennebaker, who was wonderful also. Okay, so met, I, I had met D.A. Pennebaker also and was <laughs> able to be around him a few times. I never met Ricky Leacock before he passed, but I was able to spend some time with Pennebaker and a, a lot of time with Albert um, Maisels. And I, I'm very familiar with the movement and the history and so yeah, I mean, as people are like going through it and like trying to figure out like, how do I, young people, middle-aged people, older people, how do I make these shifts <laughs> like, okay, I need to make? Okay. Like, how did you get from Club 47 to working with Ricky Leacock to making Joyce at 34 and having your daughter? Like, just share a little bit about those transitions. Becca, my year in Paris was probably the most important time because I met a group, as I say, I fell in with a group of, Swedish painters who were mostly drunk all the time. I loved their company. They were, they were old. They were 25. I was 19 or so. Uh, but they loved to go to the Paris Cinematheque. And for those who don't know it, the Cinematheque uh, is devoted to showing films every night and they program it. So let's say for one month you're watching only German directors or one month only Belmondo films are. And they, and so I went with them every night. It's the first time I ever heard of movies being discussed as film mm. and analyzed the way you would analyze literature. Right. And 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 they were reading the Cahiers du Cinema. All these true all these, all these great French directors from the '60s were then critics. So when I was running Club Forty Seven, I had a Monday night screening. I got films from the Museum of Modern Art, and I would do my own self education. So. Mm. 
after about a year or so with Club 47, I decided I wanted to make movies mm. myself. Okay. And when I left Club 47, I, I tried to get a job in Paris because I loved being there and that was hopeless. That, you know, as a foreigner, I couldn't do it. So I came back to New York and did the traditional. I slept on friends' couches and I had names of names of names of names and God knows nobody would give me a job. There weren't any jobs for women. Right. Uh, no, at the networks, I was told the same thing, CBS, NBC, learn typing, and, and then you would right. be somebody's assistant. Right. And maybe someday he will let you visit a set. Right. <laughs> it was very right. insulting. And yeah. I was literally ready to give up, and the last name, literally, it's like Laura Dernsworth, last name on my list was a man named Willard Van Dyke. Uh-huh. And Willard uh, was very, knew everybody, but he said, I know the very people for you, Lee Cock and Drew Associates, Lee Cock Penny Baker. And Robert Drew, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're revolutionizing documentary film. No, he didn't even tell me that. He said, mm-hmm. just go there and tell them mm-hmm. I sent you. Here's a, here's a piece of paper with me. Uh, he wrote something out. Mm-hmm. And I went in and uh, they were on West 43rd Street. And I won't go through the long story. I met Penny first, who sat me, okay. He, I come up to this place and I go into their small waiting room and there's nobody there. And then this guy comes in, he introduces himself. My name is Penny, Penny Baker. Here, sit down, watch this movie. He doesn't explain anything. And he puts up a film about the Kennedy Humphrey primary fight in Wisconsin in 1960. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know why it was special. Mm. I hardly ever seen a documentary, but it was the first film that had used handheld equipment made possible by the transistor, smaller portable, sound recorders, cameras you could put on your shoulder. But I was so illiterate about this. I kept my mouth shut. They hired me for $50. Well, it was so new. It was also so new. Nobody had done it. I mean, primary is the first direct cinema. I didn't know why I was That was the first. It looked normal to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what made it special, I guess, right? Um, Yeah. I mean, that's what makes Smooth Talk special. It's It's about normal like stuff and people and you can relate to the daughter and you can relate to them and you can relate to her running around the mall with her friends and like right. it's so real yeah <laughs> that's why we had to make Treat's character as real as possible because otherwise his performance is fantastical in a way you know yeah still if we had anyway so that's how I met Penny Baker yes and Lee yeah Cox, yeah great. and it, yeah and then this intersection between documentary and the foundation of documentary and how much that also, there's a through line of that, I think with, you know, other, um, yourself and some other, you know, um, especially women filmmakers that did this, these really incredible um, fiction narrative films that were so real and were so grounded and so beautiful mm-hmm. and gorgeous, but also just really captured what, you know, teenagehood really is like for adolescent women. Um, so then can you talk a little bit about um, Joyce at 34? Well, also I wanna just bring up, yeah, um, Girls at 12, right? That's the title, Girls mm-hmm. at 12. So the connection, I had read that there's a connection between Girls at 12, which is incredible. Um, and um, yeah, it's so amazing. Joyce and, 34, I made Joyce at 34 before I did. Girls. Yes, you did Joyce at 34, right. But Girls at, tw- Girls at 12, um, there's a connection to Smooth Talk, right? When Connie and June are, when Connie room had, uh, shares the memory of June taking her to uh, hang out with her when she was in the, in the band, right? In the marching band, in and the high school. To the dialogue, yes, good for Yes, you. That's, from, that's from Girls at 12, right? And that's a documentary. And it's the young girl that's 12 that's telling the story of her, her older sister letting her hang out with her when she's also no, doing, no, no, oh, no, okay. I'll correct you. Okay. <laughs> There's a scene in, okay, Girls at 12 follows three t- girls who are 12 about to enter high school. Yes. And uh, they're very excited about it and also about the possibility of the guys that they'll finally get to meet. Uh, and there's one scene where one of the main characters is at a football game and her sister plays in the band and we see her sitting with her sister in the band. She's very excited, her older sister. Right. And we use that, Tom, in writing a particular scene in Smooth Talk, use that thought when Connie, I could be specific, Connie has insulted her sister basically by talking about how wonderful boys are and right. not realizing that her sister's never been held by a boy. 
So right. the sister pulls away and Connie tries to make up to her by saying, oh, do you remember, you know, I used to sit with you in the band and you rubbed my feet. You know, this is, no, I don't remember being me. Anyway, that Tom had remembered that scene, but there's this, another scene that's directly out of it. Yeah. Right before Arnold arrives, Connie's sitting on the bed. It's ridiculous. She's just this big body sitting there stringing knees, which is what an eight-year-old should be doing. And that is in Girls at 12. Right. That same girl is stringing bees and on the radio, I didn't add it, is somebody like a Don King. And so, you know, rattling on, playing music. And I copied that for Smooth Talk. Yeah. The, the, you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and yeah. And I'm fascinated by teenage saying. girls. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and speaking of, so am I. <laughs> I mean, and honestly, I think my fascination continues to the day in part because of movies like your film um, and just how, you know, and just my interest, I think, in youth culture generally, I think what is in part rooted in this material that was so fine that I had access to at that age. Mm -hmm. And it was so respectful, you know, and Connie is so hurt when June, you know, says, she, oh, I don't remember that. I don't remember when I used to let you go, you know, with me yeah. when I was, right? I mean, she's really, yeah. And it's like, and I love that also just Laura Dern's performance, the writing, it so nails the like, the like kind of tough, like I am a teenage girl, I'm a badass, but then the sensitivity underneath, you know? I mean, there's just so many layers and that the film really captures that mm -hmm. um, contradiction that a lot, a lot of teenage girls have, you know? that there's this, you know, there's a sensitivity underneath it all. That's so just raw and, oh my God. And the stuff with her mom, yeah. That's why it was hard to catch the part. Yeah, I bet, I bet. But like maybe because you guys, you you all were raising, you had that insight. Your daughter was that age. I mean, you had, yeah, how incredible be. to have a screenplay writer and a director who are raising a daughter the same age <laughs> and then have an actor who's the same age, like, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And Laura, you know, the way Laura appears, Laura has an inner light and a goodness. And that's what comes through her performances totally. over and over again. Yeah. And that's what we needed for this part is yes. that no matter what comes out of her mouth, you know, she's essentially a very generous, empathetic yeah. person. Yeah. And, and you can't buy that, you know, yeah. it's there. And the mother's perspective. I mean, you, you know that her mother loves her fiercely. And that she's, you know, hard, you know, as moms can be, especially, you know, when you're going through that teenage, uh, like butting heads mm -hmm. kind of time that a lot of mothers and daughters do go through in that period. But yeah, I mean, her also, her. so um, girls at 12, they would all be, I think in their late fifties now, do you know, like what happened to any of the subjects of girls at 12? Yeah, one of them, Marianne, did you, you saw the film. Yes, I did, yeah. Marion, the one who's on the cheerleading team, was the first one you see in the film, yes. died. Mm, she I'm was sorry. seen in a uh, car crash. Oh. And I, and I don't know what happened to the others. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then I guess my other, you said you're very interested in, in girls' development, adolescent girls. Um, you know, as I had talked about earlier, in the 80s, it seemed like there was this kind of like a bit of a, kind of movement or scene or, or family of like fiction films about adolescent girls made uh, uh, by women. And in the seventies seemed like there was this incredible burgeoning of documentary film mm -hmm. made by women about growing up as women. And some films, some documentary like Dee Dee Halleck who trained other, you know, trained teenage girls to make their own films about their mm -hmm. own experiences. And I mean, what do you attribute, was that just feminism? Was feminism in the air? Was it coming out of like, the feminine mystique and Betty Friedan and all the stuff in the 60s that then led into this or why do you think in the seven there's such an incredible um oh, yeah. yeah like canon of of films about adolescent girls from the 70s American films from well, women and yeah I'll back you up slightly okay I'll talk about Joyce at 34. yeah uh, I had worked on editing a number of those films that Penny Baker drew Leacock group made and it closed and I was devastated my god my Great job is no longer. Um, and I did make one film with Penny, with Leacock, uh, Happy Mother. Right. right, right, right. I wanted to make my own film. And I wasn't sure what to do. And a friend of mine, I was living in Cambridge, uh, and a friend of mine who taught at Harvard 
sociology department said, you know, oh, I was pregnant. In fact, I was eight months pregnant. And she said, you're in a great position to do a film documentary to see if your relationship with your mother will change now that you're going to be a mother yourself. I said, well, I don't really like that idea. And then I said, oh, so it's so narcissistic. I, nobody's ever made a film about themselves. They're always about public events, Pol political events, or you name it. I can name all the Drew films. So I thought about it and I said, no, I don't want to do a film about my mother and myself. It should really be about what it's like to become a mother and try to keep working. And nobody had ever done a film like that. And that's how I, so I got, I, I had done something for WNET in New York, a half hour film, and they agreed to give me $10,000, which was a lot of money, uh, which would cover all my lab costs. And I uh, asked a young woman who had just graduated from college, Claudia Weil, whose boyfriend had a camera. And that's how we got to do Joyce at 34. And she, your co-director, went on to yeah. make Girlfriends. That's right. Absolutely. Which has become a cult classic and is also another film that it sees was, women in yeah. ways that are not, you know, really weren't happening at that point and in many ways don't happen to this day. Um, in fact, the subject of Girlfriends is what do I do with my life? How do I yeah. get, how do I get to, in her case, make movies? Was that what it was? Or still guitar? Yeah. And, yeah, but she's a photographer, just, right? No, yeah. I, how do I find a husband? How do I work, how do I manage the whole thing? It's this, it's uh, the same subject. It's a coming of age story. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's so, I mean, all these intersections are just so incredible. Um, and just the body of work and the legacy of, you know, everything that you've done, everything you've been part of, it's just, yeah, it's incredible. Are there films that, um, of yours that get, um, you know, now that they've seen Smooth Talk, maybe that are being introduced to your work for the first time? Are there any films that you would well, recommend? Criterion, yeah. Not Criterion, excuse me, Janus Criterion. Uh, they're preparing, they're going to be releasing Criterion Jan slash Janus films. Do I have that right? Wait, they're releasing yes. it yeah. in um, February, I think, late February, that will have on it Smooth Talk. Girls at 12, Joyce at 34, and another film of mine called Chloré and Aldi about two friends uh, who've been best friends since they were kids, who are now in their very early 20s. One has three kids, you know, her, she had a husband, but they're no longer, and one is trying to go to college. They're both black, but it's about trying to maintain their friendship with their lives going in very different directions. And that's actually one of my favorite films. And I'm so glad Criterion, I only had a 16 millimeter print and I never wanted to spend the money to get it transferred to right. a, a video link. You know, anyway, it's all gonna be on that Criterion disc, plus the interview with Joyce Carol Oates. Nice. And Laura, nice. it's gonna be full of it, full of, uh, full of Joyce Chopra. Yes, I'm yeah. Really happy that. Yeah, and I think I think yeah. Joyce at thirty four is on the Criterion Channel now. Also, if it people is. want to that, check it out, it, yeah. I'm part of a group called New Day Films. Do you know about New Day? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. In fact, that's enough. That's for those who are listening. When I did Joyce at thirty four, it was great. I had a PBS release. Wonderful. Uh, it was the first live birth ever seen on television. But uh, I didn't know how to distribute it. There weren't any distributors who wanted to take it. They said subjects about women, nobody's interested. This is in the early 70s. And I can't remember how I hooked up with these few women who had started their own distribution company. Uh, Julia Reicher, Emily Roth. I mean, anyway, New Day Films was started just because they said we did. Anyway, I joined them and we started self-distributing. And now it has, I don't know, 150 members and it's still going strong 50 years later, not 50 years later, but well, almost 50 years yeah. later, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, New Day has been around for, for a I minute. I used to mail prints myself to the libraries. I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, we did all of that ourselves, our own promotion, our own distribution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, what haven't you done? <laughs> 
what? I said, what haven't you done? <laughs> There's so much that you've done. I mean, what a life, you know? It doesn't feel that way when you do, I mean, one thing, okay, but look at, look at this. I make a film, I'm lucky to get some money from somebody, P WNET in New York, the PBS station, but then I have to figure out how to distribute it. Yeah. I mean, so it's not, it's just, one thing leads to the yeah, other. Yeah, well, it seems like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can correct me if this, does, if this is off space, but it seems like you, from the beginning, you had that kind of twin discipline, that business mind and artistic mind, you know, because you started a freaking club when you were 20. I mean, you started a business at 20 years of age. So you have, you know, great instincts, like, you know, holistically on both ends, which is rare. And that probably has come in handy to be so, you know, artistically minded and so business minded and so savvy. A daughter of a friend of mine once insulted me. She we were having an argument. She said, you're nothing but Miss IBM. And I said, no, I'm an artist. I'm not Miss IBM. <laughs> Wait, what's the IBM? I don't get it. What's the yeah. reference? Like you're a computer? Meaning like you're just like a computer? I'm, I'm a business mind. Oh, you know, business I'm a machine. Mind. I'm yeah. a machine. I yeah. said, I'm not a machine. But I Speaking, have to figure yeah. out what to do. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of IBM, Albert and, and David Mazels were hired to do a like a, a film about IBM by IBM. It's pretty interesting. It's like a you know industrial film about and it's like really early. It's it's a it's the period, it's that madman period where they when they moved the headquarters from New York City to the suburbs, which was like a big deal. They left the city, they moved to the suburbs, and it was kind of you know, they needed to do this PR thing to make themselves look good as they decamped New York City, but um, it's that whole kind of, you know, period that you started um, the club, you know, the club and coffee house what, in. So when did they make this? Um, it was, they... it was early, I, uh, early 60s, I believe. I mean, oh. maybe a little bit later, um, whatever that, that period was that, yeah, that IBM left New York City. Yeah, it would have, it would have been later than late 50s. It would have been early 60s at that point. Um, well, that's the heyday of Leacock Pennybaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that all that stuff is so amazing. Yeah. Um, are you? I'm just wondering. Are you familiar with this film that's on Amazon now, Garrett Bradley's Time? Have you seen that? Are you familiar with it, Garrett Bradley's Time? The film Time. Yeah, it's on. It's on Amazon. You might want to check it out. I think you would really appreciate it. And it's another. Um, I like to, you know, personally, and I'm curious what you think. And this is like one thing I want to end on, and then we're going to wrap this up. Like, do you have thoughts about the the term women's picture or the idea of a women's picture? Oh, yeah. I feel like women's pictures are the best, actually. <laughs> and it's not a disparaging thing. I love women's pictures. And I actually think the best documentaries are essentially women's pictures. And I would say Time is a women's picture. It's about a woman who was waiting for her husband to come home from prison. He's been in prison forever. And it and oh, it's I both it. yeah, and it's both her footage, her self documentation, her looking at herself, and then Garrett Bradley's incredible, you know, and documentation. Where is, where is it? It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Uh, but um, I feel you know, I think that like the work that you've done and like a film like Time speak to, you know, to me uh, that's the highest compliment to call something a women's picture. I think women's pictures are the best, but I think it's often kind of used as a, you know disparagingly. But I you know I think in documentary you know, films, like the films you've made in like time that really, you know, follow women and really show women and depict their experiences. And I love that stuff. So anyway, just wondering if you had any thoughts about, you know, the term a women's picture, or, you know. Oh, it was used for, I was a woman director my whole yeah. life. We, I did a lot of television, made for television movies all through the nineties and it was always, well, we're looking for a woman's director. Yeah. This is idiotic. Yeah. You know, I wound up shooting. Whatever that just, means. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's so stupid, but that was what, how it was thought of. Yeah. Early yeah. on, people literally expect me to ride with boots and a whip or something. I don't know. These cliches about <laughs> women directors. <laughs> yeah. Well, well you, wonderful. yeah. Well, you completely defy all cliche for sure. We are so grateful that you took the time um to you know sure? yeah yeah no i mean thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and thank you so much for smooth talk and all of your work and everything you've done and it was such a pleasure and a joy to actually speak to you